Our next speaker is uh, Paul Lazo, and he's going to tell us about uh, proving Dedekind's theorem in Lean. Uh, go ahead, Paul. Factorizing stuff. Very early in when we learn maths, we learn about factorizing stuff in Zs. So, for instance, if we take the number 60, this factorizes as 2 squared times 3 times 5, if I didn't make any mistakes in computation, which I hope I didn't. And one point I wanted to make is that there is a, some sort of non-uniqueness in this factorization in the sense that we can have two squared, so it's two squared times three times five, but we can also have minus two squared times three times five, et cetera. So essentially it's unique or essentially unique up to the order of the factors and up to multiplying the factors by units. And there's another way of stating what's factor how the factorization works in the integers which is by using ideals so we can write uh this factorization as the ideal generated by 60 is the ideal generated by two squares times the ideal generated by three times the ideal generated by five so i haven't really defined what these operations are on ideals and i'm going to assume people know what these are so i hope you guys know about them and one point that's quite nice is that when we write this factorization in terms of ideals, this issue with multiplying stuff by units kind of disappears. So for instance, the ideal generated by minus two is the same as the ideal generated by two. So there's no longer this need to deal with associate associates when we're stating. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no need to fill with associates. Um, so one thing that's quite interesting with Dedekind's theorem, Dedekind theorem is it tells us how we factorize ideals when we're moving into larger rings. So I've shown you how we can factorize the ideal generated by 60 in the ring of integers. And so now if we move to the Gaussian integers ZI, 60 factorizes quite differently. So it's going to factorize like this because some of the primes in its factorization are going to split up into smaller primes because so the primes in the factorization of 60 in the integers aren't necessarily primes in the Gaussian integers. And so this kind of raises an interesting question, which is how would we figure out what the factorization of some number is when we move into a large ring? And so uh, the Dedekind's theorem provides us with a partial answer to this question, which is that all we need to know is to know how to factorize a polynomial over finite fields. So it's a partial answer just because it doesn't work always. We have to assume certain conditions on the ideals we're working with. So I'm going to introduce a bit of notation now, which is the stuff we're going to be using later on. So we're going to take P to be a prime number, a prime number in the integers, K to be a number field, alpha to be a primitive element of K, so an element that generates K as a, an extension of Q f to be the minimal polynomial of alpha over q, and f bar to be the reduction of f modulo p. So one thing I should have actually stated here is that we're going to assume alpha is an algebraic integer, which means that f has coefficients in the integers, otherwise we couldn't reduce it modulo p. And um, so what we're going to start by doing is we're going to factorize the original generated by p in the ring of integers of k. So because OK is a Dedekind domain, we can factorize this ideal into a product of prime ideals, which is this. And we can also factorize F bar, or rather the ideal generated by F bar as a product of prime ideals too. So to get the um, factorization of the ideal generated by F bar, we can just take each prime factor of F bar and consider the ideals generated by these prime factors. And so what the Dedekind's theorem tells us is that if we assume certain conditions on P, then these prime factorizations are going to have the same shape. So what this means, if I go back one slide, over here we had different exponents. So we had the EIs at the top and the FIs at the bottom. And so now we know that we have a same, the same number of prime factors and the same exponents. So if I were to be careful, I would have to say up to permutation, because we always, always, you always have to deal with the order of the prime factors, but I'm not going to be very careful here. And so 
another thing that Dudikin's theorem tells us is a way to compute the prime factors P, the PIs, the prime factors of P, the ideal generated by P. So it gives us an explicit formula. So P, the PI is going to be equal to the ideal generated. Um, I think there's a bit of noise coming from someone's mic. If um, I don't know if I'm the only one hearing it or not. Can anyone else hear the noise? I think it's from Kevin's hand. Okay. I think so too. Seems to be gone. Okay, well, I'll just continue. So, uh, the theorem gives us a way to find the generators of the ideal PI. So, it's going to be generated by the prime P plus um, capital Pi I of alpha. So, I haven't really told you what Pi I is yet. So, Pi I is going to be any polynomial in Z of X which reduces to smaller Pi I with modulo P. So um, the question then is how do we fact or how do we formalize this theorem? So um, the steps I followed were first constructing the actual map between the ideals because essentially what we're doing is we're going to construct a bijection between the ideals that appear in the factorization of the ideal generated by P in OK and the ideals that appear in the prime factorization of the ideal generated by F bar in the field of P elements. So then we have to prove that this is actually a bijection between the prime factors, and then that this bijection preserves the exponents in the prime factorizations. So first of all, setting up the bijection, one key observation we have to make is that the quotient OK over the ideal generated by P is isomorphic to the quotient of FP of X by F bar. So um, I'm not actually going to prove this because um, it depends on the conditions uh, you ask on P when, the fire, when expressing the theorem and haven't really told you what we actually require from P for this to work. But I'm just going to assume that this actually holds and work from there. So we have a theorem that's very, fairly easy to prove, which is that if R is a ring and I is an ideal of R, then we have a bijection between the, the maximal ideals in R that contain I and the maximal ideals of R quotients I. So we may be wondering why on earth do we actually care about maximal ideals? Because I was telling you about prime factors or prime ideals. And so the reason we can do this is because we're going to be working with Dedekind domains. And so in a Dedekind domain, maximal ideals are prime ideals. So we don't really have to worry about that. So now using this result uh, and this theorem we have, we can immediately say that there is a bijection between the maximal ideals of OK that contain the ideal generated by P and the maximal ideals in FP of X that contain F bar. So why is that? Well, we have a bijection between the maximal ideals in OK that contain P and the maximal ideals in OK quotient P. And on the other side, we have a bijection between the maximal ideals in FP of X that contain the ideal generated by F bar and the maximal ideals in FP of X quotients F bar. And so since the two rings at the bottom are isomorphic, they have the same number of maximal ideals. And so we're good. So this gives us a bijection. The thing is, it's not necessarily very explicit. So we'd maybe want to get something a bit better. And we can, in fact, get something a bit better. So what we're going to do is going to use a bit more of the information we have about the things we're dealing with. So so far, we've just assumed that we had two rings, R and T, and that I and J were ideals of R, of R and T, respectively, and that the quotients were isomorphic. But in our situation, we have actually a bit more. Namely, we have this. So we have our isomorphism at the bottom with our quotients. But we also know that we have homomorphisms going in from the ring Z of T into FP of T and into OK. So the homomorphism going from the ring of polynomials over the integers into the ring of polynomials over FP is just reduction modulo P, whilst uh, the homomorphism going from the ring of polynomials over Z to the ring of algebraic integers of our field K is just evaluating polynomial at alpha, which is the primitive element of the extension. 
And another thing we know is that this diagram actually commutes. So following Gwen path, starting at Z of T and going down to OK quotient P is the same thing as going along the other way. And so we can make this slightly more abstract just by facing these by rings, more general rings, and asking for homomorphisms F and G that make this diagram commute. And so we're still assuming that the quotient of R by I is isomorphic to the quotient of T by J. And one extra thing we're going to assume is that G is subjective. The reason we'll be assuming this is that we're going to be taking ideals in T and then considering their pre-images in S. And having G subjective is quite important for the way the map will work. And so if we assume this, um, the bijection I'd mentioned previously and that we'd defined in a bit more abstract sense actually has a more explicit description, which is that it takes an ideal M in T and maps it to the ideal generated by taking the pre-image of M by G. So we take an ideal M here, we lift it to the ring S and then we send it back into the ring R. So we have to consider the ideal that's generated by this because the image itself may not be an ideal, and then we add the ideal i to this. And so then we can specialize it to the situation we're interested in, namely Dedekind's theorem. And then this gives us the map that comes up in the statements of the theorem. So, so far, what we've done is we've defined the bijection. I haven't actually proven it's a bijection because that's slightly annoying. And I mean, I'd, had, I'd said. I'd given you some information about why it was a bijection using this result, but no explicit arguments. And formalizing it in Neen is kind of quite annoying. And so the final part, which you may have seen in this slide, is we need to show that the multiplicities agree. So we're not, what I mean by multiplicity of pi in the prime factorization of f bar is, uh, so multiplicity pi f bar is the multiplicity mm -hmm. of the ideal generated by pi in the prime factorization of f bar. And so uh, this is the part I actually haven't finished working on in my formalization. I'm doing it at the minute. And so the idea for proving this is quite similar to what we've done previously. We use the isomorphism between these two rings. And we can show that the multiplicity of a prime factor can be encoded as some algebraic invariants. And since these two rings are isomorphic, this algebraic invariant will be conserved by the isomorphism. And so we can retrieve multiplicities on each side and prove they're equal. So this is a bit of a hand wavy argument, but I don't have much more so far in terms of my kind of lean codes or anything. So I hope this wasn't too unclear. Sorry about, uh, got a bit confused at some moments, but that's it for me. Do you have any questions?